I'm reading from the book of Titus, chapter 2, verses 11 to 13. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly loss, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. God bless his word this morning. This morning, my topic will be living godly in a world that is going wrong, in an ungodly world. How can we live right in the world that's going wrong? As mothers, as believers, as those who call themselves family, we are called, the Bible says, unto righteousness in the face of a sinful corrupt, violent, evil world. Therefore, we as believers must separate ourselves. The Bible says that any nation, a community, a people, they can only become strong because of righteousness and their right of standing in God. Or as Christians, our only desire is to live for him and to serve him and to please him. I am sure that most of you have seen the three chimpanzees, those little monkeys, one that's covering the eye, one it's covering the air, and one it's covering the mouth. And the caption reads like this, I will see no evil. I will hear no evil, and I will speak no evil. As Christians, we need to close our eyes to the things that is around us and go down on bended knees. We need to close our ears and tune out to the lies of the enemy and open our ears to the word of God. We need to speak truth when the lies come. No gossip, no backbiting, but we need to speak truth. For the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard what God has in store for you and me if only we would serve him in righteousness. What a privilege it is as believers to be enlightened by the Holy Spirit to live right in a world that is going wrong. So therefore, I'd like to speak about three things today. If we are going to live in this world and go right, there are some things we need to do. And the first thing I'll be talking to you about today is we must live soberly. And how can we live soberly? We must have a sober mind. The second thing, we must choose good. We must make right decisions. And the third thing, we must not stagger or waver. The second point is, we must live godly. How can we live godly in a world that's going wrong? We must deny all ungodliness. There's a difference between godly and ungodly, and we must be obedient and ready for change. The third thing, we must live righteously. In this present world, we are to distance ourselves through separation, and the second thing, we must not compromise, but we must live with a purpose, shine our lives. In all these, I am going to weave in all that I told you just now. So the first thing I like to talk about is to be sober-minded. To be sober-minded means you must control your appetite, your passion, your affection. The word soberly here does not mean that you are intoxicated. Now, I am sure you have seen some people who have been under the influence. In my family, I was able to see a lot of that. Now, you would see a quiet person.
person becoming very loud and speaking. A very quiet person will become angry and wants to pick a fight. And that's in my family. I'm not talking about your family. <laughs> but a sober-minded Christian must have the mind of Christ. As mothers, when dealing with our children, we must have a sober mind. Do you agree with me? We must have the mind of Christ. Otherwise, we will put them down. <laughs> Now, there are some decisions we have to make when teaching our children. And one of the things we teach them is how to fear God. A sober-minded Christian must have change of ways and talking and thinking. Because we are now taking on the mind of Christ. It doesn't mean that we are in the world and we just have to be on one level. But it helps us to make right decision when things are going wrong. We as Christians must walk in integrity. Our walk will determine who we really are. Others will see the Christ that's living in us. A sober-minded Christian is not a scary person, is not ashamed to tell others about Christ on the workplace, on the streets or wherever you are. You are not ashamed. The sober-minded Christian doesn't mean that you must not have fun because there is a lot of lovely things in this world that we can enjoy between getting ourselves all messed up. The sober-minded person must be focusing on the grace of God. That's the thing that keeps us. Jesus Christ must be our view. When we look at Jesus Christ, the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. The Bible says when we trust him with all our hearts, he will not put us to shame. 1 Peter 5, 8 reminds us that we must be sober. We must be vigilant. We must be watchful, prayerful, discerning the times we are living in. In order to fight this fate of faith, the fight of faith, we must understand that we have an enemy who is targeting at our souls. So the struggle is against flesh and blood but it's against principalities and powers and rulers of this world. So instead of allowing our minds to be clouded with foolish thinking and empty pleasures, we should abstain from such things. That would hinder our walk with God. And now there is a lot of empty noise up there and a lot of distraction to pull us away. But let us keep our minds on the Lord Jesus Christ. As Christians, we can stay strong to our beliefs. We have to live. Our, our society is constantly challenging us that we to draw our attention away. But in order to do so, we must stand with a conscious mind with the knowledge of knowing who Christ is in our lives. A sober-minded Christian will not stagger because that sober-minded Christian know who God is in their life. Faith is our driving force. The tests we might face in life's journey is not to reveal how weak we are, but the strength that he has given us. We will rise as we wait upon the Lord this morning. God will give us his strength to go on. For in faith, our faith from time to time. But we know that there is something greater living inside of us than he that's in the world. Romans 4.24 says that Abraham staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief. But he was strong in faith, trusting God, fully persuaded that he knew that what God promised him, 
he is able to bring to pass. Abraham did not tiptoe around God's promises, but he took the plan straight into the promises of God, and he came through strong and victorious. You too can come through strong and victorious this morning. There is no impossible situation for you this morning. Your situation might become dull, but listen to me. God is able to bring it to pass. When Abraham was 99 years of age, God gave him the promise. None of you here today is 99. So God will show up for you. I want you to know that. But when he shows up, he's not going to just show up. He's coming to make himself known. He is coming to let you know that the broken hearted will be mended. Oh, the bitterness will be gone. He can take the dry bush and make it holy grounds for you. He will fire you up. He will cause your faith to rise. He will take the ordinary and turn it into the extraordinary this morning. God wants to take your situation that you feel that you're bound in and that you can't move. And he wants to give you a miracle. He'll show up for you today. My second point is, how can I live godly in a world that's ungodly? 2 Corinthians 2, 7, 1 says, Having therefore these promises dearly, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all unrighteousness, all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. The promises are God, strong reason for us to follow after God. Without holiness, the Bible says, no man can see God. The influence of the Holy Spirit can purify your hearts and minds. And this should be our prayer today to make us more like Jesus. The alarming thing is that most Christian people live without realizing that they have been seduced by the world. A number of excuses we can hear. And I jot down some things here. Hear what we say can justify our sinful behavior. We make excuses. But the God of the world has blinded the eyes of the unbeliever. People say we are living in a new time. Yes, that's true. We are from the old school. We are the okay people. I don't care what kind of school you might come from, how okay you might be, your excuse have no value on the word of God. If God says so, it is so. If God condemns it, it is condemned. Living a godly life in a godly world calls for a life of separation. We have to choose. The choice is us this morning. We have to choose what we want in our lives. First John 17, 16 says, Jesus knew that in this world, we will be faced with serious problems. And so he prayed, Father, my prayer is that you take them out of the world that, and that you protect them from the evil one. We, are, we must remember, church, we are in this world, but we are just passing through. This is not our final destination. This is just a place that we are be here for a time, but our real home is on high. Even the heathen knows that it is by our fruits we will be known. People ignore this, the problem of sin sexuality, murders, theft, violence, and corruption. But the godly and the ungodly, there is two different types of lifestyle. The godly man or woman is an object of ridicule. Many people will call you names when you take a stand, especially 
if you're a young person, a teenager, they call you names. They put labels on you. But it doesn't matter who called you what. You know the real person and who is living inside of you. As a child of God, our holiness hangs on not what people did for us, but what God did for us. Think about it this morning. The godly man must resist the flesh. This defines what the world system consists of. In 1 John 2.16 says, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, the three sins. The speech of the godly is seasoned with grace and goodness. The speech of the ungodly is vain. There must be this dividing line between the world and the child of God. When we fall into different temptation, the conviction of the Holy Spirit should be there in our lives to cause us to think and be straight. We must cultivate godliness in an ungodly world. It is a struggle, and believe you, I know many times when kids go to school, there is peer pressure. But as we know, the struggle too will end. Amen. Jesus pray, pray that he will, del that the he will deliver us from the temptation. Amen. It is not an easy life. It is not an easy walk. But as Candace said this morning, I prayed for her even in elementary school when her eyes couldn't even open. And she would just turn her air, deaf air on this and turn it around. But I did not care because I know what she was going to face. There are many struggles and obstacles there that your children have to endure. And we as mothers, as fathers, as uncles, as brothers, we need to stand in there and believe God for the miracle for our children. David Livingston went to one of the darkest places in Africa. After some times, his missions wrote to him saying that some of the people would like to visit him. And they wanted to know which was the easiest way out. Livingston wrote back to the missionary saying, if they are looking for the easy way out, tell them to stay in England. Because there is no easy way out. If you are looking for an easy way out, there is no easy way out. You just got to keep walking and trusting God day by day. You got to keep serving God and believing God for your miracle day after day. It won't happen if you don't do it. You see, the road to victory is a hard walk, but it's a rewarding walk. When some people facing obstacles, they turn to different things. They turn to drugs, alcohol, physical violence, murders, abuse, mental illness, these struggles are real. And good counseling might be able to help. But I am telling you, it only takes the power of God to break every addiction in your life. Help might be in the, on your way. But God is your helper. And my third point is, how do I live a righteous life in an ungodly world? To live righteously means to obey God's commandment. To live in a way that is honorable, virtue, purity, correctness of thinking, and feelings. Righteousness starts from the heart. There must be a change from the inside if you're going to be walking this Christian walk. It's the way to, we live and talk that in our daily life and in our walk, Christ will be seen. Righteousness is not only a walk,
but it's a lifestyle to the believer. That distinguishes the Christian, and it is in opposition to the world. Our walk is in opposition to the world. The righteous, the Bible says, will flourish with the beauty of Jesus Christ. If you're looking for true beauty, true beauty is in the Lord Jesus Christ. God takes special interest on the child of God. Righteousness will cause us to look forward to our eternal destination. For this is our eternal hope. When we walk in righteousness, we are walking on solid ground. Hallelujah. Oh, my feet will be established on the grounds, on solid grounds. Oh, things might get shaky from time to time, but I know where I'm standing and who I'm standing in because in Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other grounds is sinking sand. Oh, I stand upon the word of God today because he is my rock. He is my light in the darkness. When darkness come and the light shines, it will eliminate all darkness. Because here comes the child of God. Here comes the child of God with a testimony. Here comes the child of God with a blessing. Here comes the child of God with a word of encouragement. God is on our side. Being established will position our, uh, position our constant fellowship with God. Because sin stands in opposition to God. You see, sin has always been the number one problem. In order for us to live righteously, we should not compromise. That's the big sin. There's a lot of pressure out there for us to behave like the world, act like the world, talk like the world, and dress like the world. We exchange worship for entertainment. We clutter our souls while listening to ungodly songs. We find ourselves in places we have no right to. And yet, as a child of God, some of us feel comfortable. No conviction. We feed ourselves with garbage in and garbage out. We watch movies that has no right to be looking at. We lost after this thing. Pornography, violence. Instead of feeding our minds on spiritual things, we take the time to feed our minds on garbage. And we lost after these things. Lifestyles weren't condemned by the churches and now embraced by the churches with rules and regulations. Some denominations have altered their, their, their standard to accommodate these lifestyles. But I say, God have mercy on us this morning. May God have mercy on the churches this morning. We do things to suit people and to suit ourselves. Satan always makes sure the steps of compromise is very small, so we can't even distinguish it. Isaiah 5.20 says, Woe! unto them that call good evil and evil good and darkness light and light darkness and sweet bitter and bitter sweet they can't even discern illustration the hunt about compromise the hunter and the bear it was winter time and this hunter needed a fur coat to keep himself warm so he decided to take his rifle and he went into the forest. While he approached the forest and he looked up, there was a nice grizzly bear with a big fur coat. So he took his rifle and aimed towards the bear. Just then, the bear smoke, spoke in a soft, sweet voice. You are cold, and I am hungry. Why don't we sit and negotiate? <laughs> so, the, so the hunter took his rifle down. He went to sit with the bear, and they began to negotiate. After 
for a little while, the bear walked away with a full stomach. And he had his fur coat. There is, we cannot compromise with the enemy. He will chew us up and eat us. Satan say, let's negotiate. We cannot negotiate. Because if God says no, it is no. We compromise our messages to suit the audience. We don't want to lose people because we want a full few. We don't want to talk about sin, repentance, the blood of Jesus, being saved. We prefer different messages, prosperity messages, motivational messages. It is okay to live the old lifestyle and be okay. That's what they say. We compromise the Lord day for personal preferences. Some choose today's carnival, and I'm sure some of them has already gone to carnival. We choose that instead of coming to the house of the Lord. But we are commanded in God's word, in Hebrews 10, 25, if we want to stir up our faith in God, we need to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Some of us compromise a good game instead of prayer meeting. And yet we want to be strong in the Lord. And we question, how am I not getting strong in the Lord? You really don't want to admit that you are cold, you are lukewarm, and you are indifferent. Compromise is said to be the cancer of the church. It is easy to compromise by offering different substitutes and we have convincing excuses. But as Christians, we need to set apart ourselves. In all things Paul say, let us put on the breastplate of righteousness so that we would be able to stand in this day, in this age, and in this time against the attack of the enemy. If you are going to protect your children, your home, and your family, you need to put the breastplate of righteousness on and walk with a garment of praise and believe God for your family. Nobody's going to do it. You have to do it. Sin is still the number one problem. Sin and righteousness will still exalt a nation, but sin is our problem. Followers of Christ, we need to clean up our ways of speaking. We speak lies. We speak curse words. We talk rumors and gossip and think nothing about it because there's no conviction. You think it's okay. No, it's not. The Bible says in James 1 and 2, wherefore lay aside all filthiness. How can we lay aside all on filthiness? All filthiness. When we want to live godly in an ungodly world, it's to pursue after these things. In conclusion, how we as mothers and fathers believe we can live godly in this world that's going wrong. We need to know who we are in Christ Jesus. We need to recognize who the enemy is and who we are fighting against. There is a war, and the war is between you and God, the world, and sin. Like the three chimpanzees, let our eyes be closed to the things that we are seeing around and we go down and bend the knees. We are not ignoring the problem now. We are looking at the problem, but we are dealing with the problem in prayer. Amen. Our ears, let us tune out to the lies that the enemy might be telling you, to the gossip, to the wrong things, and let us tune in our ears to the spirit of the living God. Amen. Let our mouths speak blessings instead of cursing. Amen. 
Let our mouth speak truth. If we take heed into the word of God and to God, we will live and focus. Let us focus our mind to live soberly, to live righteously, and to live godly in this present world. In this world, it calls for a life of separation. The Bible says, by this, all men, good, evil, bad, whoever, will see who you are and your walk in Christ Jesus and will bless you. May God bless you this morning for his word. I say happy Mother's Day to each and every one of you. May the Lord bless you today. May the Lord bless you and cause his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. May he enlarge on your territory this morning. May he increase your walk with God today. God is looking for faithful men and women who will trust him and believe him in this crucial time, in this serious time when we have to cause our light to shine in a dark, and in a dark world. God bless you this morning. God bless you this morning as the worship team begin to play. We are not finishes yet. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening.